right, welcome back, everyone. Um, so you're, you're in for a little entertainment now. Um, tell us what we're going to see. Well, this will be the first year that Pixar has released two movies in one year. Inside Out just came out. But at the end of the year, we're releasing uh, The Good Dinosaur. Um, so this, to this group, it's the first time that we will uh, show the trailer for The Good Dinosaur. So, so and, and, and I should just preface uh, with saying that you should put your cell phones away because we're actually, this is the honor system now, but you're not allowed to record per Pixar rules. So I'm going to be the bad guy and let you know that. Um, let's see it. My first question to you is, is this movie going to make us cry as much as Inside Out? How many of you have seen Inside Out, by the way? Raise your hand. Quite a few. Well, I, I don't know. With every one of our films, we do try to touch an emotion, but we don't try to do the same emotion each time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, we try to connect with something, and, and there, there are a, there's a complex array in every one of us, and our belief is, that's how you make a good movie, you should touch something. But we don't want to repeat ourselves. So this film is entirely different than Inside Out. Well, the one thing you do repeat is, is this kind of uh, adherence to perfection. And you've actually said that, um, or Pixar has, has said that quality is the best business plan. Can you talk about the process? Because you, know, you have a lot of people in the room, I'm sure, who um, try to get their software out very quickly to iterate rapidly. You guys spend a long time on each movie. I mean, Inside Out, that was a multi, multi-year process with several you know, uh, uh, sl delays along the way. Same with this movie. Can you talk about the process? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, we, first of all, we have to iterate internally. Mm -hmm. Because once you release the film, you can't actually go back and fix it. Right. No software updates. No software <laughs> updates. Um, and we will, um, uh, we will sometimes do major restarts. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very painful, it's extremely costly, but we would rather uh, face the failure internally rather than release it that way. <clears throat> but the thing we start with is we require of all the directors that they go outside to some place new and they, they bring in something that they didn't know about. Mm -hmm. the, the temptation is if you see somebody else successful, 
in the film business and, of course, in technology business, then you think, I can make the processes better and cheaper and, and I can do a better job and so you're in that kind of competition, but essentially it's derivative work. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a, uh, frequently a successful strategy because companies do make money doing that. Mm -hmm. But this is not what we want to do. So for you, just because something works actually means you shouldn't do it again. That's right. Uh -huh. uh, I, personally, I think of risk as coming in three different phases, uh, whether it's technology or building a team or, or the idea. And the first phase is to decide what the risk is. So with, with a movie uh, idea, some of them are low commercial risk. They're still hard to make. They're all hard to make. But doing Incredibles 2 is low commercial risk. Mm -hmm. Doing um, a Ratatouille, a rat that wants to cook, or Inside Out, mm -hmm. this high commercial risk. These would fail the elevator test. Mm -hmm. And no matter how successful Up is, you will never sell a lot of toy walkers. <laughs> so so the, and it's the same with technology. Sometimes we'll take big risk on technology, sometimes small. So that's phase one. Mm -hmm. Phase two is working out the consequences of the decisions that we made, because a lot of our decisions don't work out. So that's where the internal iteration comes in and fixing things. And then phase three is lock and load, where w while we can still have big surprises, we do not intentionally introduce new risk. Mm -hmm. So the upfront part is that we want to do something which is new, original, something where there's a good chance of failure. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, we, we, we fail all along the way. Mm -hmm. That is our process. So last year, you actually didn't release a single Pixar movie, right? That's correct. And that was the first time in a long time that you hadn't done that. The first time, I think, since you were acquired by Disney. Am I right? Well, we, uh, that, since being acquired by Disney, that's uh -huh. right. Now, we have had films before that have had restarts. We've had three uh -huh. complete restarts before. For which movies? Uh, Toy Story 2 was a complete restart. Um, uh, Ratatouille was a restart. Uh, we had one other film. It's the only film that we've ever started that we didn't complete. So this is our Inside, uh, Inside Out is our 15th film. Mm -hmm. We had one that we didn't complete. And what we did was, since we always finish it, we went to Pete Docter and said, we'd like you to restart that movie. Mm -hmm. The movie was Newt. And he said, okay, I'll do it. And he came up with an idea. But he said, as long as I'm restarting, I have an idea which I think is better. <laughs> and it's about emotions inside the head of a little girl. Mm -hmm. So we agreed it was a better idea. Um, and then uh, what else do we restart? Oh, then, well, then uh, uh, this movie. Good Dinosaur. Yeah. So what was, what was the, the, the hiccup with this movie? Well, um, it, it's not so much a hiccup as when we start making a film, uh, we, we start with the, the passion of a person. They build a, a team around them. And the only thing we have to go in on is how well that team works together. Mm -hmm. Because when they put together the first version of it, it always sucks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't mean this in the sense that we're being modest or self-effacing. I mean it in the sense that it sucks. Always. Yeah, always. They've always sucked. Mm -hmm. And so you go through and you try to fix it. And you, what you're doing is you're iterating and trying to fix the problems and, and, and the, 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 the people who know how to fix the problems getting together on a regular basis to help the, the director. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the, the team doesn't gel and, uh, and, and we begin, uh, they begin to lose confidence. And at that point we have to make a change and sometimes do a restart. We always have to do some setback or reset. Mm -hmm. And we, we just never know how big it's going to be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and, and some people might not know, but um, Ed wrote a book basically on culture called Creativity Inc. Um, you started out as a technologist, and your dream was always to, to create a, a computer-generated animated movie, right? Completed that. Um, can you talk a bit about your approach to culture and sort of how you've driven that, not only at Pixar, but also at Disney at large, now that you run both studios, help to run both studios? Well, it, at Pixar, at, at the time we were failing as a company, <laughs> the thing I observed is that there were successful companies in Silicon Valley, and they were the companies the equivalent of, you, you know, like Google and Apple today, but at that time it was Sun and Silicon Graphics and, and so forth. 
And what would happen is the companies would be very successful. They'd go public, they'd you know, get their pictures out of magazines and so forth. And then they'd fall apart. They'd do something really stupid. Not that there's anything wrong with that, the magazine side. Well, well no, the, but if one is part of a process, what happens is it leads to a delusion. And the delusion is that our success makes us draw a lot of wrong conclusions. We, in other words, we draw the simple conclusion that what we're doing is right, so I'll keep doing that. And, uh, and a lot of those conclusions are actually incorrect or they're wrong mm -hmm. because we don't fully acknowledge the things that we can't see in this process, either random events or contributions by, by people. The other is the storytelling of what took place has to be simplified. So if you think about, uh, like when, when anybody writes a story or tells a story it's on whether, whatever media it's on, it has to be a simplification. Well, at some point, the leaders of the companies begin to believe the simplification. Mm -hmm. All right, this is not good. Mm -hmm. So at that time, the question was, would, if we were successful, would we fall into this trap? Mm -hmm. And when Toy Story came out, um, then I, I, could begin, I could begin to see the process apply to us. Mm -hmm. And so the cultural question began, became, how do we avoid that trap? So we've gone through various phases, fallen off cliffs, cliffs but trying to at least be self-aware about the traps that we saw others fall into, including the traps we saw Disney fall into, mm -hmm. and which meant there's a lot of angst, a lot of existential things that are happening all the time. Uh, and they still continue to this day. So you can't help but, after you've had a lot of successes, to have new people come in and feel this incredible burden on them mm -hmm. when they're now working with their legends. Nine years ago, uh, Disney bought Pixar, and they put Disney Animation under us. Mm -hmm. And Disney Animation, uh, in the 90s, had four hugely successful films. So there was uh, Little, Little Mermaid, Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, mm -hmm. Aladdin, and Lion King. Then it was downhill for 17 years. Mm -hmm. So when we came in, they were demoralized, they were dispirited, and they were failing as a company. So this is this great opportunity. Can we take these ideas and apply them to a group that was fundamentally broken mm -hmm. and see if the ideas work? And so we decided to keep them entirely separate. They're not allowed to do any production work for each other at all. Mm -hmm. And so we explained the principles in about four hours. Mm -hmm. They all nodded their heads in agreement. This all makes perfect sense. It took four years for them to deeply get it. And now, of course, they've and every, every film has been a success since then. And now, and you still split, you and, and John Lasseter, you split your time between Emeryville and, and, and Southern California. Right, for nine years, we go down there Tuesday morning and come back Wednesday night. Every week? Every week. And is it still completely separate? Yeah. We are, uh, we do have a, a couple of areas of sharing. One was with technology, mm -hmm. and we're very careful about this, and it's a principle trying to spread across Disney is we have two R&D groups and two technology groups. And we said to each one, you may beg, borrow, and steal ideas from the other group, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. So they have different pipelines, they have different R&D groups. But because they don't have to take anything from the other, mm -hmm. and they respect each other, they get together and they openly share, and they take whatever they want, knowing they don't have to. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's created a great sharing but we've got two different groups taking different approaches to the problems, and we are stronger for it. And what about Lucasfilm, which is also obviously owned by Disney and, and where you actually started the technology for Pixar, right? Do you guys have the same kind of collaboration with them where you can beg, borrow, and steal? Yes, so w once they were acquired, we went to that technical group, which is very strong. They're obviously in the effects area, mm -hmm. and, and they're part of this conference every year where the three groups come together. Got it, that must be a lot of fun. Um, Talk to us about what the Brain Trust is. This is something you started at Pixar and that now exists at Disney Animation as well. Can you explain it? Yes, and the, the truth is we, we came upon it accidentally because uh -huh. our first five people were pretty phenomenal. And so we, we took the principle of how these guys work together and we applied it to other groups and it didn't work. So then we had to go back and figure out, okay, what is it about this group that was working that didn't work with other groups? Mm -hmm. And from that, we came up with some principles, which we do apply. And this is what we took down to Disney. Um, 
when, now when you talk about the brain trust, it's not a group of people that exist all the time. Mm -hmm. It's what we call the group that come together to solve a problem, usually for meetings after we viewed what a film is or a two-day offsite. And it operates under four principles. Uh, one of them is that um, the, um, nobody can override the director. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, basically we uh, remove the power structure from the room. So John's notes uh, are my notes, so we can't override the director. Mm -hmm. Now, it's easier said than done because people will sometimes defer to what they perceive the power structure to be. But it's a conscious effort to, to not have that. The second is it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So that it's filmmaker talking to filmmaker. It's not uh, uh, boss talking to filmmaker, boss talking to employee. Mm -hmm. um, the third but one... you can't override the director. Well, it's because the director is it's, it's their project. It's his or her project. Uh -huh. All right, they're the ones who are responsible. The reason we have to remove the power structure is if they know the group can override them, mm -hmm. then they will enter the room in a defensive posture. Mm. And that will make it so they don't listen. By allowing them to say, no, the choice is really yours, they then can come in, because they're highly exposed, mm -hmm. and then they can listen. And they will treat the comments as comments to help them. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, third principle is that um, they all share in each other's success. They have a vested interest in each other's uh -huh. success. And the last one is just that they give and take honest notes. And so those are principles. Now, we don't always live up to them. Because mm -hmm. right, it's hard to Which do Which is the hardest one? Uh, I would probably say the power structure one. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there are consequences of that. What it does is you kind of pull back from the honest notes. Mm -hmm. Now, we usually do live up to them. That's why the films are pretty good. Every once in a while, they're just flaming disasters. Uh -huh. We have to reconvene with a smaller group because those things get in the way. They're mm -hmm. subconscious things. People can't help themselves. Every once in a while, magic happens. And with, by, by magic, what, that, what I mean is there's the loss of the ego in the room. And what you see are ideas going out. It doesn't matter whether they're bad or good. Uh, nobody's clinging to them. They're just focused on the problem. And almost every film has one of those times, usually a two-day offsite, when the magic takes place. And you can't, because we don't record them, right? all you can do is say, oh, it's, it's, it's an amazing event when it happens. Uh -huh. Can you give an example of, of a, a particular movie um, where the brain trust really kind of forced a director to completely change their mind or influence them to change their mind on something pretty major? Yeah, well, but again, as you pull back, it's, it's not force, but the right. influence is there. This is when the magic happens. So Frozen is an example of that. Mm -hmm. So Frozen actually is a project that's been around Disney for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And then somebody came in with a, an idea with it, and it wasn't quite gelling. So, the issue is you had this queen, was she a bad queen? Initially, she had an army of bad snowmen. Oh, Olaf is much better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. so there were all sorts of problems. And so how bad was this queen? And, you know, and, and it, was, it was a sister story, but it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. So we had an offsite when all of a sudden everything clicked. And there, were, there was just this realization about what it was really about and the whole thing turned on itself when you walked out saying, okay, now we've got a movie, now we can see it. And until that point, we didn't have it. Hmm. And if you don't have those points, that's when you sometimes have a restart because you, you never know if you're gonna find that point. In which case you say, okay, I give up, I have to restart. Um, we'll take questions from the audience in, in just a, a minute or two, by the way. Um, can you describe your, your approach to um, technology and, and creativity or storytelling and sort of what drives, how, how one drives the other? Well, the, the one thing which would surprise some people is that we never take ideas from the outside. Mm -hmm. And the reason is a movie is not 
an idea. It's literally tens of thousands of decisions and ideas. And I think most good products are this way. And so there's an illusion that when they see something beautiful and elegant that, you know, there's this sort of simple process behind it, when in fact there's a tremendous amount behind it. So uh, what we go for instead is, okay, who's got the passion? So that's the starting point. Somebody's got a passion for an idea. And in fact, what we do is we go to the, we pick the person, and then we say, come up with three ideas. Mm -hmm. And the reason we ask them to come up with three ideas is that they'll usually get stuck. So if they get stuck, they'll move to their, their idea. Mm -hmm. So we give them three to rotate through until they're ready to present all three. And then the following thing always happens. They walk in and they'll say, I love all ideas equally. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to me which one you pick. Now they're lying through their teeth. Because <laughs> when they make the presentation, it's clear that they favor one. Mm -hmm. And that's the one we pick. And then they start the process of bringing in a writer to help work it through. And it's just trying to build through uh, use good storytelling, but also touch something uh, emotionally. And then again, as I mentioned, go into the outside world and bringing something that isn't obvious. Mm -hmm. So we're not, it's not derivative of other films. Mm -hmm. It Quest takes about four to six years. Wow, amazing. Um, questions from the audience? Just one sec, I think there's one over there. There's a microphone coming to you from both sides. <laughs> Hi, uh, S.J. Camarado with Esri. I'm curious, you're talking about the brain, your brain trust, and I'm wondering, in, in our company, we have a lot of meetings. Sometimes there are four people, sometimes there are 30 people, especially the executive or the board level, we kind of break up. Is there an optimum number you found, so that sweet spot where there's 25 too many, fours too little, and that brain trust where you actually get that magic you're created? Well, when you've got a really difficult problem and things aren't working out and, the, and, and there's a lot of emotion, then it's got to pretty much drop down into the six, seven range. Uh, if things are going pretty well, we will go up to 25 or 30. A and the reason is we want people to observe the process. We also want to make sure there aren't, there's not a clear boundary, that is everybody can participate. Clearly there are people who are more vocal and are more experienced at it, and we need the other people to see how it works, to be able to engage and get the experience and the confidence. I think there was a question over here. You have a microphone coming. Thank you. Uh, Such Chandaria with Katisa. Uh, on one hand, with the amazing success you've had with Pixar and Disney, uh, you know, clearly you've got a great process. In your book, you also write about, you know, how you never want to be lulled by that success. That's a very difficult tension, or very difficult balance to maintain. How, how do you do it? How do you not get sucked into what you know you're doing well, so that you're always vigilant and, and constantly testing yourself? Um, well, well, the first thing to know is I'm a calm and optimistic person. And, I, and I'm not actually paranoid, um, so I don't want this to be interpreted incorrectly. But I believe there's always something going wrong. And I, and, and I say this in the sense that when you are the leader, you actually begin to lose touch because people are afraid to tell you things. Now, your close friends aren't, but new people coming in because of the position actually start to back off. And, but because you haven't changed, I, feel, I, don't, I don't think, I've changed, I mean, I've got more experience, but I don't think my personality has changed. But there are more people who are actually afraid of saying what they, they think. Afraid maybe is too strong of a word, but they hold back, they're respectful. And, and so what you get are these invisible barriers, and you have to be really aware that they're there. All right, and these are emotional issues that people have, and you have to recognize that they're always at play, uh, and that People are afraid of failure. And I mean, as, you, as you know, when you're in businesses, a lot of your businesses are going to fail, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and your processes fail, right? Uh, but w there's an academic meaning for failure, which is that fail is part of learning. And we all get that. But there's another emotional part of failure, the one that we learn at school, which is that when you fail a class or a test, it means you screwed up, or you didn't start study hard enough, or you weren't smart enough. 
But even beyond that, in politics and business, failure is used as a bludgeon in which to go against opponents. So there's a palpable aura of danger around failure. All right, now those things coexist inside each one of us, inside of our employees. They don't want to look bad. They don't want to let you down. So we have to recognize the consequences of those real feelings that are in people, even if they disguise them. And in recognizing their two meetings and that they're at play at all times, we can then try to be aware of them and make it safer for them to be creative. Now, now there's one point I want to make about Disney, is that Disney's now successful, but basically it's the same people who were there when they were failing. All right, so it wasn't as like we replaced them with new people who are now creative or fresh young blood. We took, I mean, there were new people that came in, and there were people that left, but basically it's the same. What we were doing is paying attention to removing the barriers to fear that got in the way of the creativity, and they're always popping up in new different ways, and they still are to this day. So there are major issues that we're addressing at Pixar right now, and it's just, you know, they're, they're ping-ponging back and forth. Like they're out of phase with each other, thank goodness. <laughs> we're, we're actually out of time, I'm so sorry, um, but maybe you can catch Ed afterwards. And just real quick, leave us with this. What is your favorite movie that you've worked on? You said that earlier that people who say they don't have a favorite are lying through their teeth, so give us yours. Well, okay, there's the, there's the, the cheap answer, uh -huh. which is it's like being asked, what's your favorite child, <laughs> right? And you know that you can't say. Mm -hmm. Right, for obvious reasons. And the real answer. So the real answer is, the films don't mean the same thing to me. Uh -huh. Because I watched them being made, and I watched the disasters, and I watched the turnaround. Then they are part of the film. And so I look at those and say, Toy Story 1 meant something to me because we figured out when he didn't know, when none of us knew what the hell we were doing. Toy Story 2 was a complete meltdown where we did a restart. Uh, Ratatouille, you know, watching Genius at Play where he took a bad idea and all of a sudden made it, it brilliant. Every one of them has a different story. So uh, that's why I actually can't say the favorite ones because they're all these tremendous learning experiences that don't mean the same thing to me as they would to the audience member. All right. We'll I'm you still lying through my teeth. But. Yeah, you totally are. <laughs> Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>